Coming up next, you know, we talk about those rare hit songs that have been lightning in a bottle. You know, where an artist or a band releases a song that absolutely dominates the charts and it hypnotizes our culture for a time, and then of course never rises to those levels again. What about the one album Warriors? Uh, this is when one album has several big hits and then can't duplicate that success again, either song-wise or album-wise. Up next, the lead singer of a band that had one such album tells the story of a wondrous period where his band was at the top of the charts with a platinum album, a number one single, and two other big hits from the same record. And a new episode of Bottle Lightning is coming right to you next on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to write down the top 40 countdown in your Trapper Keeper as you listen to Casey Kasem counting them down, you're going to love this channel. Uh, make sure that you subscribe below right now. Click that bell to get the story straight from the artist about the greatest songs. You can also become an honorary producer by clicking on our Patreon link. That's in the description. Uh, we have some awesome content going up there just for patrons. And also check out our new merch as well, including our brand new series, The Vintage Years Collection. So it's time for another edition of our series, Bottle Lightning. This is where we break down the history of a beloved one-hit extravaganza. Now this still resonates in our culture. Following up on our Mr. Mr. episode a few weeks ago where we talk about it from the album side, we're going to do the same today, only with a different group. Uh, this European band had a song that left the world transfixed. It went to the top of the charts in both the U.S., here, and Canada, and it was top five pretty much everywhere else in the world, including number four in the UK and Australia. Take a look. Then after dominating MTV and the charts with their classic 80s hit, they followed up with their second straight top 10 hit, I've Been In Love Before. That went to number nine in the US and number two on the AC charts. Then the fast-paced, heartfelt anthem, one for the Mockingbird, that went to number 38, and it was used in the 80s movie Can't Buy Me Love, classic for all 80s kids. This gave him three consecutive top 40 hits from the same album. That album was broadcast. It uh, went to number 16 on the album charts. It also went to uh, almost platinum, I think. And they were nominated for a Grammy later in the year for Best New Artist. It was in 87. The band at that time consisted of singer-songwriter and rhythm guitarist Nick Van Eed, along with underrated guitarist the late Kevin McMichael. There was bassist and instrumentalist Colin Farley and uh, drummer percussionist Martin Beadle. The album broadcast was proof that their best days were ahead of them. So what went wrong? Up next, we sit down with lead singer and songwriter Nick Van Eed, and we find out the story of this album and these three hits, and then we're going to try to answer the question. Now, as we go into this interview with Nick, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand of glasses that I wear every single day. Now, right now, you can get over 1,100 pairs of glasses for less than $7. That's about a fourth of the price of a brand new vinyl record. If you're in the market for a new pair of glasses or you know, have a loved one or a significant other with a birthday coming up, Zenny Eyewear is a wonderful choice. Just go to zenny.com right uh, today to take advantage of this great deal. Here's Nick Vanny with the story. Have you heard some of the great covers that people have done of I Just Done in Your Arms? Bastille did one. Yeah, Bastille's you know? good, yeah. Oh, I, I just died in your arms tonight. Bastille was very good for us because they're a young British band, so the hip factor was great. Oh, yeah. Put that one on Facebook, it went patoosh. Jason Donovan, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, I just died in your arms tonight. My favorite cover is The Northern Kings. Just astonishing. I just And also how it's been used in pop culture, TV, movies, never been kissed. Really? Hot Rod. Must have been something you said. Hot Tub Hot Time, time Machine. Time machine. <laughs> Adam, hey. But also Rock Band and Grand Theft Auto. That was the same. Grand Theft. Can yeah. I tell you the Grand oh, Theft yeah, story? Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so this is way back. 
And I have a, an email on my wall in my studio <laughs> that says, hey, Nick, uh, Sony ACV Publishing here from London. And I, you know, we, we've had a request from some game thing called Grand Theft Auto. I uh, want to use Died in Your Arms. And I was like, yeah, great. I think you make a lot of money from this sort of stuff. You know, I was thinking, mm. So yeah. I remember writing that. So I have the, 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 the thread on my wall and it goes, okay, cool. But just, just I don't want to get involved in anything too violent. Okay, because there's a lot of stuff around. <laughs> and they wrote back, nothing violent here. <laughs> and then my thread is, okay, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Wow. That's cool. That's a so, great story. I mean, I, I, I guess I could have written back and gone, I rec you know, but I didn't know until three. Honestly, oh, yeah. we, we, we're a pop band, you know, yeah. we're on the road. Oh, so yeah. two years later, people are phoning up going, like, love hearing your song with a guy getting his head blown off. <laughs> <laughs> What I love about your songs, the syncopation of the words, there's no forced word. I love how you, your space in your songs and the syncopation, it's like nothing's forced. Mm -hmm. It just falls right into line. And that goes back to that thing about, you know, sitting at the keyboard or the guitar and just letting it flow out. You just reflect back and these words come out. I'm not religious at all. I'm yes. a very spiritual, very spiritual person. And I totally believe in the muse. I think there is a thing where you get touched yes. every now and again. It may happen once a month, it may happen once a year, it may happen six times a day, I don't know. <laughs> but you've got to tune into it. And I firmly believe that when you get lucky that way or you open all your things to let it bring in, it comes in. But then it's your responsibility to go, I recognize that, that's pretty good. Because most times we're too busy we're on, I, I remember writing down words sometimes, and I think, oh my God, where do those words go? That was the muse again, and I, it's gone forever. But we died in your arms and been in love before, and maybe five or six other songs I've written in my life, that was, came from nowhere. And you have a responsibility then to go, I'm gonna get this down. And I don't know how many other people have told you that in interviews, but I'm an older, I'm 58 now, and I'm an older man, and looking back, I totally see that. You get this, and if you're a fool, if you don't take those. One for the Mockingbird. Okay. My, one hey. of my favorite songs of all time. I love your energy in that song because the screaming, the yeah. You told me this, he did say this. I think this really is one of his favorite songs. You told me this on the way up. Thank yeah. you. That's <laughs> a very big uh, accolade. It's a cool song. I wish it had been a proper hit. It's not anthemic, obviously, but when, he, when you get it, it is. <laughs> it's got scar bass on it. Mm, 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 mm. He's playing the ups. Every right. time I put, we do a lot of these things where you don't play with your same band, and the guy goes, dum, 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 and the band, and, no, I have, dun, 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 and I go, what are you doing? And he goes, <laughs> playing the notes. I said, no, you're not. It's, it's, um, 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 um. it's up. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that's what makes it, so that's different. So this is me before a hit record mm -hmm. at 27, 26, 20, 26 years old. Um, I've been doing it since I was seven. So I've been doing it for nine years. All the stuff that all your other interviews got, those nine years of nothing. Those nine years of girls and chemistry and um, late nights. But in the end, look, waking up in the morning going, I'm broke. And I wrote this song because I started feeling, this before Kevin arrived in England, I started feeling I was getting a bit of direction. And so you won't see the bastards knock the running out of me. Is It's absolutely aimed at those people that rejected me or the press. Yeah. I've been in bands before, you know. And press actually, I don't give a shit about this. <laughs> I really don't. Doubt is not the running out of me. I've had some cracking bad reviews and I've had some cracking good reviews. But in the end, Kevin used to get so upset by them. God, I just have to cuddle Kevin, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Cool, you know. Yeah, I said, yeah, Kevin, yeah. it's okay, you know. Um, but. That's, that was my, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, the Mockingbirds, those guys that want to mock you. In everything we do, you want to become the next new American high jump champion, you know. 
hey, you know, hey, you, with your long legs, you're going to get it. And then six years later, and you haven't become the hike, but you might next year, okay, you won't see the bastards not the running out of me. And I think that res resounded with a lot of people, whether it be people, I don't talk about high jump champions, but just anybody in life. Kind of, you know, you get fired, fired from your job and you go, so yeah, I, I, that song has had more responses from Dying Your Arms, obviously, but Mockingbird on the kind of, yeah, yeah. I get it, I oh, get yeah. it. That oh, yeah. finger pointing, and I think you were kind of doing that, so. No, it you. is. I never got a penny off my old man, but I got everything. Just, he yeah. was there. I remember watching, uh, being in a music shop one day. He was a DJ, he was a yeah. Saturday night DJ. You know, as we say, bar mitzvahs, funerals and weddings, you know, super uncool. But my dad, and um, so he used to go and buy, you know, the latest, this is talking 70s, 80s, the latest flashing light thing, you know, sound to light, is that what they called it? And I was listening, so he's buying this, and I'm in the corner watching this guy playing in a trainer amplifier, a trainer, with reverb on. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like this, and he said, you want that, don't you? I said, I've never asked for anything, ever. But he said, okay, I'll get it, and you wash my car whenever I ask you to. <laughs> and he did. He did for years. He did for years, but yeah. I got that amp. And um, what I'm saying is that your dad butted heads with you, but you connected on one thing. My dad was always there for me. But the mockingbirds, the mockingbird syndrome is, I saw it around me all the time. I saw it around other people at school where... My drummer in my first band, his dad couldn't wait for him to sell his kit. You know, just give him two years to have a go, but no. So he did, he sold his kit and never played drums again. Another guy was my best friend. I actually met up with him again now. Back then it was like we would write dreadful songs together, but he was my <laughs> best mate. He, he just stopped because of parental thing. So parental or peer pressure or whatever, you gotta have all those things lined up. And that's what rock and roll's for, man. Rock and roll is for you to say, to hell with the man. Totally. And that's those what guys didn't. the Mockingbird was. It was, and those guys didn't. And I, they disappointed me, frankly. It picked me up, and I still listen to it to this day. I think it's a dark horse anthem. Oh, you know, yeah. Bruce writes great anthems. Yeah. Johnny Cougar, Mellencamp, whatever else, you know. We've all done them. And I'm an Englishman telling you about the British guys. <laughs> I can show you some English ones. But this is a bit of a dark horse anthem. And when you it actually is. go... You start getting that scar beat, and by the time he gets to the chorus, <laughs> one for the Mockingbird, you know? It's like saying, yeah, that's yeah. the one for the Mockingbird. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Close my eyes. Well, I've been in love before. Another just beautiful song, another top 10 hit went to number nine. Also went to number two on the AC charts. Another crossover hit. But that is so Beatles-esque. What was the inspiration of that song? When you write songs, and again, you know, without being any kind of Uncle Nick figure, to anybody younger writing songs, sometimes it's good to just buy a new bit of kit, even yeah. if it costs you 100 bucks, yeah. 20 bucks, I don't care. Right. Because if you get a new bit of kit, it sounds different, and you get excited by it, and that's what I did. I bought a Poly 800 Korg, who the older people in the audience will go, well, that was a pretty shitty bit of gear. But it's what I could afford then. And it just sounded good. So I started pumping away on the chords. I was still living at home then, for heaven's sake. Mum was like going, uh, come up, it's lunch now, Nick. And I was like, no, I got something going on. I got something going on. And she said, well, it'll go cold. You know, we all have that. Yeah. And the chords are very beautiful, they're just very simple. Well, I can sing it, I don't know. Catch my breath, close my eyes. Don't believe a word. It's simple, it's immediate, it's pretty. Um, well, and it sticks with you. I love the part 
The hardest part is when you're in it. It's mm. just so simple. That was absolutely heartbreak song. Yeah, that was oh, yeah. absolutely. It was, um, but I wasn't in heartbreak then, but it, you know, maybe a great writer, you know, great novelist and all that. Great, how dare I? But you just reflect back and these words come out. Well, and I love the video. Again, the music video, beautiful video. The American one, and, and yes. with the girls and the cellos and the- Oh yeah. Oh, oh, gorgeous video. Yeah. Because yeah. it was great that they were able to match the yeah, beauty work, of the it? song with the video. So after Nick and the band rocked the charts, they released their sophomore album, The Scattering. That was in late spring of uh, 1989. Nick Van Ede was high on it, saying that the title track of The Scattering was actually his favorite song he'd ever penned. He said, and I quote, I think it's one of my best lyrics telling of how the small villages and rural communities can die out when the lifeblood youth move away to the big cities. We had a lot of fun recording it as we flew down from the Scotland with the Whistle Binkies, who are a fabulous and famous folk band. We had uh, only five hours to record all their parts, which included a lot of instruments. Now, this is still a firm favorite when we play it live, even without the folk band. Nick Vanny also talked about the frustrations that he had with the continual delay that uh, the band experienced, Cutting Crew, while they were making this album. He actually referred to it in the album's lead single, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, where he's saying, I got a brick, but I can't find a window. I got a brick, but I can't find a window. Nick would convey the frustrations that he felt as the American A&R department uh, that was supposed to be championing the, uh, the band and the album. It continually blocked the album's release for months, and he felt that that depleted the band's momentum, which he's very right. Uh, that album would take over two and a half years to come out after the band hit number one with uh, Just Died in Your Arms Tonight. And that was just too much time between releases. Now, The Scattering ended up peaking at number 150 on the album charts. Uh, its singles also failed to connect with the exception of the great single, Everything But My Pride. That did go to number four on the adult contemporary charts. But the best any of the songs did on the coveted Hot 100 were when uh, Between a Rock and a Hard Place stalled at uh, number 77. From there, bassist Colin Farley and drummer Martin Beadle exited. Nick Van Eden, fellow guitarist and bandmate Kevin McMichael continued on. They released one final cutting crew record in October of 92. It didn't chart at all. The band finally split up in uh, 93 the next year. I think there was just too much time between album releases, if you want my opinion on it. When your first few singles hit, you have to keep feeding that monster. And by the time the second album came out, we were about to enter the 90s. Also, as good as several of the songs are from The Scattering, there wasn't a once-in-a-lifetime song like I Just Died in Your Arms, but you know, lesser bands have been able to pull a rabbit out of their hat with less. There were definitely a few songs that could have been top 10 hits with solid promotion. After all, Nick Van Eed looked like a matinee idol, and the dynamic between he and guitarist Kevin McMichael was a winning duo. Pretty much the label, they dropped the ball on this one, on the band, on the album, and it probably stopped the cutting crew into being more than what they were. Now, Kevin McMichael ended up playing with Robert Plant later. When I say he was underrated, I wasn't kidding. When he first played something for Robert Plant, who had requested that you know he play something, after Kevin wowed him with uh, some Buffalo Springfield and Moby Grape, I guess Robert Plant's jaw hit the ground. He said that he picked me up off the sofa and said, never leave me. Kevin was nominated for a Grammy for his work with Plant. A miller were my train. Sadly, Kevin McMichael passed away from lung cancer in 2002. And Nick Van Eden continues to tour with the popularity of Cutting Crew continuing uh, into the next generations, due to the heart-stopping 80s power ballad, I Just Died in Your Arms Tonight, which has been used in pop culture time and time again. Um, it's just a song that keeps on giving. I, I just died in your arms tonight. 
Leave us a comment about Cutting Crew and this fabulous three-hit bottle lightning album. What are your memories of these songs and that wondrous time in music, 86, 87? Uh, why do you think Cutting Crew never had another massive hit or why they didn't uh, go on after that? Let us know below. Also, make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you get the story straight from the artist. And uh, make sure to check out our Patreon. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.